nothing nicer than to be introduced by a friend. Uh, my, that's my colleague and friend, Professor Ron Kluger. I also wanted to mention a couple of other colleagues who are here. Professor Paul Brummer, who has a session of this meeting devoted to his work. Professor Mitch Winnick, another one who is similarly honored. And I feel very honored myself to be asked to kick off the ball at the beginning of this gigantic conference. I'm very impressed that there's anybody here. This is supper time. Um, but thank you for coming. Uh, what I've been asked to do really is to philosophize a bit about chemistry. And that's very appropriate because chemistry for the first half century and or so of its existence was called chemical philosophy. And uh, I'm just looking at you people in the audience, and uh, some of you are doctors of philosophy, none of you, uh, some of you are aspiring doctors of philosophy, but none of you doctors of chemistry. So the words do go together. And I'm going to uh, read to you a paragraph from the introduction of an early chemistry text. It was written by Sir Humphrey Davy, whose name I think most of you know. Uh, the text was called Chemical Philosophy, and I haven't actually read it. I got this out of a book which is on sale now, I mean, not at reduced price, but available now, The Age of Wonder, a book by Richard Holmes, and a marvelous book about the origins of our field and the origins of science at the beginning of the 19th century. The whole history is short. Anyway, so here we go with the opening of Chemical Philosophy by Humphrey Davy. And what he wrote was, the almost imperceptible de decay of the fallen branches of a tree exposed to the atmosphere has in common with the rapid combustion of logs in our fireplace the fact that both are equally chemical processes. So I, I omitted to say that Humphrey Davy had set out on a profession as a poet, uh, and he was getting interested in chemistry. And the conjunction isn't altogether silly. I mean, we have a huge, vast field and, and a less than vast theory to uh, help us over the chasms we have to cross. And it is some sort of poetic sense about the symmetries of nature that makes it possible for us to survive. So here's the father of all of us, Humphrey Davy, uh, re till recently a poet, uh, speaking as a chemist about the marvel of oxidation. He says, really, that whether we rot or burn, uh, it's all the same. It's oxidation. And if you do go to this book that I just mentioned, The Age of Wonder, which I'm recommending so much, Richard Holmes, uh, you can read all about Humphrey Davy's love life, and you'll find out that when he wrote the book, he was passionately in love, and, but he was also in love with chemistry. And so that raises a question, what on earth is it about chemistry that arouses our passion? We're told often by people who don't know us terribly well, but it's curiosity. And I, I think that's absurd. Curiosity is idle, and we are not. Uh, our passion for this subject has a whole bunch of sources, but at the top of the list, I would put the excitement of the chase. And that contributes to passion in all its forms, we want to possess an untried fact. We want to give it our name, if we can. We want to make it our own. Now, I have to confess, that's essentially a self-centered pursuit, but it brings with it unexpected rewards. We become part of a community. 
And that outcome should be a source of hope for all. Through competition, and we're all competing with each other, comes respect. This despite the fact that the competition is a tough one. The rewards for making a discovery second are much smaller. But it's a competition that's governed by rules. The rules ensure that we're all sometimes winners, more often losers. And we come to realize that in order to share the joys, we have to share the burdens. If that model could be emulated in other fields, the global competition for wealth, for health, and for status, we would have come close to establishing heaven on earth. The realization of the civilized nature of what you and I do is really the first reason that we rejoice in doing it, whether we're conscious of it or not. We take pride too in the tangible benefits of science. You're going to hear some amazing ones in the speech directly after this. Half of us would not be here, but for the chemistry that nourishes us, shelters us, and heals us. But there are good reasons why we should mention the practicalities, which I just listed, only after the civilizing effects of doing science. And the first such reason is that if it weren't for the fact that it's a civilized pursuit, all of the technology that flows from science and from chemistry would be as likely to kill us as to cure us. And the second reason is, as you've heard before, that we have to foster the wellsprings of science if we're to profit from the marvelous technology downstream. And that's an old story. The need to foster basic science is one that you've heard trumpeted, even the younger members of the audience have heard trumpeted many times. Such declarations are widely applauded and then often ignored. And one can see why. We have in this country particularly a problem. We're not world beaters in technology. Governments, therefore, make lists of technologies in which we must become competitive. Our competitors also make such lists. They are, in fact, the same lists. What is to be done? And the usual answer that sneaks in is that excellence in science is essential, so why not ask, why not direct, indeed, our most excellent scientists to the problems of greatest utility? Well, as a policy, that overlooks two things, one pretty obvious, one more subtle. The obvious one, I hope it's obvious, is the top-down direction tends to be unimaginative. The new opportunities that are going to give us real advantages in the marketplace are invariably surprising. Often, they elude for a long time the scientists who are closest to them. They will elude bureaucrats even longer. Once again, I return for the last time to Humphrey Davy because he illustrates this point quite beautifully. He pioneered st studies of the physiological effects of the chemicals, the gases, in fact, 
that were for the first time being isolated. This was in 1800. And bravely and ethically, he tried them out on himself first. And the first one he tried was carbon monoxide. So uh, we were lucky that wasn't the end of the story. It nearly killed him, he reported, and he switched to nitrous oxide, a much better choice. Uh, and, and here's a quotation, actually, it's from the same book. After drinking, this is Humphrey Davy speaking, after drinking two glasses of brandy and sitting for some time reading Condorcet's Life of Voltaire, I inhaled six quarts of nitrous oxide. I lost consciousness. It was quickly restored, and I endeavored to make a bystander acquainted with my pleasure by laughing and stamping my feet. Well, he repeated the experiment very properly with and without Brandy or Voltaire. And, <laughs> and he made a statement which, uh, with which I want to end this uh, excursion into two centuries ago, uh, a statement as to what was his ambition in doing this. And he said, Humphrey Davy, I dream of greatness and utility. That should be the basis for our national science policy. And you'll see why. Davy makes dreaming a precondition of utility. Dreaming allows one to escape the bounds of convention, to leap the barriers to discovery. Since science is about finding new rules, it requires we break old ones. And to the extent that the science that we do is predetermined by higher authority, uh, we are hindered in the pursuit of discovery. Well, I'm wrong. I have one more thing to say about Humphrey Davy. He failed at one point, as we all do, and it was, in fact, in connection with nitrous oxide. He had within his grasp one of the greatest discoveries in the history of medicine anesthesia. He knew that he could produce oblivion without doing damage. But neither he nor anybody else who was in charge of making policy had wrapped their mind around the fact that this was an option. Pain, after all, was natural. It was a part of childbirth. Surgeons were trained for speed and skill in order to get the pain over. And so a complete new point of view was needed even to make that step from a discovery that clearly had utility to the actual use of it. So what I'm saying is that the Making of discoveries requires that one be allowed to dream, but so too does the quest for application. One sees that, hears that said less often. In science as in technology, success hinges on the ability to ask the right question. And I think that's where I'm going to end the philosophizing part of this talk. But I should end by asking, how does one ask the right question? Partly, of course, as we all know, qualities of mind are needed. But as much as that, you need a cultural milieu which is supportive. And you need teachers, you need colleagues who shape your thinking. And you need to live in a time and a place which is hospitable to dreams. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to now show a few slides because no lecture is complete without PowerPoints. And I'll uh, just figure out how to start. The first picture is of a contemporary of, uh, let me just switch this on, on, 
John Dalton, a contemporary of Humphrey Davies, but it does make a bridge uh, to what I want to tell you subsequently. Um, John Dalton is sitting in a chair, and it's a rather peculiar and personal thing to be telling you, but that chair, he, John Dalton was a teacher in Manchester, and I was brought up in Manchester. And uh, my father was a professor of chemistry. Somebody was just asking me that at Manchester University. And that chair was at the end of my father's desk. Uh, and uh, something I've not even had an occasion to tell my wife. And so I can make a boast that I've never made before that at the age of five, I occupied the John Dalton chair. Uh, <laughs> and uh, everything has been downhill since. <laughs> Um, here, 12 years later, at the age of 17, I actually enrolled at Manchester University, and I was a first-year student. And in the lecture hall where I studied, on the wall as you came in, was this piece of manuscript, which was from a first edition of John Dalton's work. And what you're looking at, uh, which is being heard, no. You mean that the sound disappeared and returned? So I'm supposed to face forward whenever possible and point over my shoulder. Um, okay. Um, I think that you understand that up above in that picture are atoms, down below are molecules. The first molecule you encounter at the left is water, but it isn't quite right, it's O combined with H. But the concept, it's very cheering really, that you can be wrong and, and yet right. The concept was enormously powerful that one could, as in Rubik's Cube, I think it is, shove around these little uh, elements and that way find out the constituents of molecular matter. And I'm sure that my teachers were influenced by this and my teacher's teachers. Uh, I wasn't as influenced as I should be. I was running a newspaper called the Liberal News and proclaiming the fact. We were, it was two years into the atomic age and I was warning the world that international relations had to change. I'm still doing that. And, but uh, my teachers were paying attention to John Dalton and to the spirit of John Dalton, and they were saying to themselves what I hope you have the opportunity to say to yourselves at your educational institutions, uh, namely, things of note have been done here in these surroundings and can be again. And what the, they said to me, and this time I was forced to listen, was that the moment had been reached in history where uh, molecular physics could be applied to chemistry with big gains. And what uh, had produced, uh, for example, the physics of uh, the scattering of elementary particles uh, could now be used to study chemical reactions at the crossing point between molecular beams. And various of my friends did undertake that. I came to Toronto by a slightly circuitous route, and though listening still to my teachers there, indeed, as I am to this day, because they still color uh, my choice of question to ask hugely, uh, listening to them, realizing that I wasn't good enough to do cross-molecular beams, I thought that we might get molecules that had engaged in chemical reaction to signal to us their states of motion by their vibration and rotation. And that meant looking at infrared emission from chemical reactions occurring at low pressure. And whoops, I am going too fast. There is the picture of my first student, a very brilliant fellow called Ken Cashin, uh, who I owed to the generosity of the chair of the department. Ken Cashin was sort of 
pushed in my direction, poor fellow, and he knew how to do infrared spectroscopy, which I'd never done in my life. That object, which I don't dare look at over my shoulder, is an infrared spectrometer, and the little white dot in front of it uh, is the reaction vessel. There it is in which we mixed hydrogen atoms coming from an electric discharge with chlorine molecules and a spectrum, infrared emission spectrum, very bad one was traced on that piece of paper there. And uh, Ken Cashin went on to wrote, write his PhD thesis. Um, we had some information and what was it? Uh, it was a bunch of peaks in a spectrum. Each peak denotes the intensity of some infrared emission. The infrared emission in its turn tells you the population of that vibrational rotational state among newly born in this, well, reaction products. And so we had to invent a way of telling people about it. And we invented these plots, which are actually the red part of the plot is a hill sticking out at you, and it is a hill in a space which is measured in vibration going up, rotation going that way, and therefore, since the energy has to go somewhere, increasing translation as you go towards the origin. And so, this is a hill in vibration, rotation, translation space, and it was a newish thought, and off we went to a Gordon conference to meet our cross-molecular beam colleagues who had studied the same reaction, and we could then compare notes as to the translational energy, which they could directly measure because they were looking at scattering from the crossing point of two beams. The results disagreed hideously. I remember feeling quite sick sitting on the grass at the Gordon conference. but. Uh, I didn't explain to you their technique was very much harder than ours, and at this moment they were wrong, and soon these results were reconciled. Well, so what had we learnt? It takes very little time to say. Going in the forward direction, we'd learnt that some chemical reactions like to form vibration excited products, some others don't. Going in the backward direction, uh, and actually we could do that uh, by consuming vibrationally rotation excited molecules in chemical reactions. Going in the backward direction, we found out that some types of motion, vibration, were better for a category of reaction which you know as endothermic, yes, it's written there, and translation, collision energy, was better for surmounting the hill if the reaction was exothermic. So, that was enough. Uh, and. Uh, marks, I think, the point where, for two slides, I'm going to tell you what we do currently in the same laboratory. And it's much the same thing. We're still interested in how chemicals move when reacting, but now we're interested in how they move when reacting with a surface. And the, this is an animation. In a moment, I'll show you reality. The uh, difference in the passage of time, with the passage of time, you see the date has changed to 2004. The difference is that a totally unexpected discovery has been made which allows you to sense individual molecules. So instead of looking at molecules a billion at a time, as in the cross molecular beam work, as in the infrared chemiluminescence work, you can look at molecules one at a time. And so here we have self-assembled, but this is only an artist impression. We have self-assembled at the left a circle of methyl bromide molecules. Actually, we didn't have to self-assemble them. They self-assembled themselves into a circle because they like holding hands. We then flashed a laser, and you see a lightning bolt at it, and a reaction occurred. And on the right, you see there is a circle of bromine atoms and the methyls are in a desultory way leaving the surface. We have imprinted, therefore, a circle of atoms. And I have to thank the Xerox company for being far-sighted enough to think 
that this may have practical implications in making it possible to imprint patterns of molecular scale. Well, that we are now pursuing, and I, but I want to just close by explaining the other dimensions that obtrude into anybody's work, and one is the push toward devices. And, oh, I missed out the most important picture. This is Jody Yang's PhD thesis, and this time it's not an artist's impression. Uh, nature is the artist, and what you are looking at is a circle of 12 bromine atoms that have been imprinted by a flash of light on a self-assembled circle of metal bromide. And that's for real. That's scanning tunneling microscopy. So the push to application. The scientist is engineer. That's not something uh, even the purest scientist, uh, uh, if there is such a thing, disdains. It's fascinating, but it's also demanding. And uh, we were pushed a little to build a laser uh, based on vibrational excitation in chemical reaction. And it was some time ago. Uh, alone, we couldn't have done it. It was done with the help of an engineer, Terrell Cool, at uh, uh, Northwestern. No, I've got Northwestern on my mind. Uh, for good reason, you'll see in a moment. Cornell. Uh, Terrell Cool designed that object so that we could scale up our chemical reaction. And where I'm pointing, which is more or less at you, a laser beam came out. And so we had a device, if anybody wanted it, and actually uh, some billions of dollars were spent in that direction. But then the horizon moves a little further away, uh, not just device, but device for what? And this particular device got picked up in an interesting way. These are a couple of reagents in two cylinders, and they're going to be mixed, and they're going to form hydrogen halide, which was one of our favorite molecules. And the hope had been, and this of course goes back a while, but it's still a dream that is very prevalent, and I think very misleading, uh, because it doesn't lead anywhere except to expenditure of funds and increased armaments. But Anyway, here was the attempt to use a chemical laser and successfully to burn up an incoming missile. And of course, the catch is that this device would have to be very good because the missile is unfortunately very good indeed. Um, I uh, have left in my package of slides a couple more. Uh, I think that the next one takes us to a meeting that was held a few blocks away from here uh, at the University of Toronto where, in fact, the work that I described was done. And uh, those of you who are old enough or Canadian enough will recognize Pierre Trudeau there. Uh, we invited him to come and see whether one could, in fact, apply reason to slowing down an arms race which seemed to be leading to disaster and uh, also argue people out of the notion that protection lies in sophisticated medieval walls uh, called missile defense. And we had our meeting uh, and many more and, and still will. Uh, I now wanted to show you something, two more slides, and this one is a really hard one to show and maybe I can't, let's just see. I think this is... Uh, you know, nothing could be more emblematic of the confrontation uh, between uh, man and machine. Uh, this chap happened to be passing on his way back from doing his shopping, and he felt he could reason, and I think he was right, 
uh, with not with the machine, but with the person in it. When the my little uh, film ends, he actually climbs up on the track, sticks his head inside the cockpit, and starts to argue. Um, the last slide is just a uh, reminder of somebody who has sunk from the news, but his name is Fong Li Ji, and he's a scientist like you. And at the time in 1989, when uh, students were asking questions in Tiananmen Square, uh, there were a lot of students on the most wanted list and in terrible peril. But at the top of the most wanted list was a professional astronomer uh, who I knew and uh, whose letters to the government I have read, actually. They were very gentle letters. And his, you know, he, he struck fear into the leadership of a country of 1.2 billion people. And so one has to ask, how the heck could he have done that? Well, what his letter said, his very gentle, very polite letter was, uh, could the government not consider that sometimes it might be wrong? <laughs> and what he was really saying was uh, that there are no sacred texts. Uh, in this case, the text of Karl Marx, but I would apply the same to other sacred texts. And the viewpoint, in fact, uh, that he expressed would put your life in danger in quite a large hunk of the world still today. But I think a diminishing part of the world because uh, the uh, right to ask questions, which is really what we all do in a civilized, a systematic, and as humble a way as we can, the right to ask questions is central to our being as humans. So uh, let's treasure that right to speak and equally the obligation which goes with it, which you've been fulfilling, which is to listen. Uh, and if that's the case, chemical philosophy has a future of, I think, unimaginable greatness. Thank you all. Thank you, John. I think you've made thousands of new friends here at your very engaging talk. And we'll all look forward to scrambling for books with Humphrey Davy in them. Thank you, John.